All right, and welcome to Free Geek's first ever webinar. So uh, I am really, really excited to be here, and I'm really happy that you are here to join us for Free Geek's first ever webinar. Uh, if you're watching after on our YouTube channel, welcome. Uh, we really, really hope that you will be able to uh, ask us any questions. So uh, feel free to leave any comments, including if you are uh, watching in the chat or if you are watching after on YouTube. With that, let's go ahead and get started. So we are going to be going over uh, the getting started with your FreeGeek computer. So if you have received a desktop or a laptop from us, uh, we're gonna show you how to get it set up uh, as well as show you how to use the computer uh, just so that you are feeling really good and really comfortable with the machine. And we're also gonna give you a few additional resources so that you can continue to learn as we're uh, continuing to use our computer. My name is Tom, uh, he, him, his are my pronouns. I'm the technology education coordinator here at FreeGeek. I've been here for about five years, uh, but I've only been in this role for the last couple of years. Uh, I am, again, really, really excited for this to be launching. Most of our classes are typically run by volunteer instructors, and so I'm really excited to uh, soon be inviting them back to also be able to teach classes like this, as well as some of our other classes that we've taught in the past. So today, like I said, we're going to be going over the getting started with your FreeGeek computer. So what we're going to be doing is what's called a hybrid style webinar, which means that uh, this part, which we're doing right now, is live. Uh, but a large percentage of this webinar will be uh, a pre-recorded video. So um, once we jump into how to set up the FreeGeek computer, uh, that will be a pre-recorded session of about 10 or so minutes. And then we're going to come back live where I will be uh, talking to you a little bit about free and open source software and why FreeGeek chooses to use uh, Linux Mint. And then we will go back to how to use your computer, which again will be a pre-recorded session. Uh, during this time, I will be still available in the chat. So if you are uh, on a mobile device or using a computer, you can feel free to chat with us and we'll talk about how to do that in just a second. Uh, you can feel free to chat with us and I will make sure to answer any questions that you might have. And then again, if you are watching afterwards on our YouTube channel, you can feel free to leave a comment and we will try and answer them as quickly as possible. Uh, after we go through how to use your FreeGeek computer, uh, there will be a live Q&A session. So I'll be online for probably about a half an hour after our uh, video wraps up to answer any questions that you have live as well as uh, kind of showing you, again, how to continue learning so that you can get the most out of your computer. So once again, uh, this will be a mix of, this webinar will be a mix of live and pre-recorded sessions. Uh, if you are uh, using a computer to uh, watch this webinar, whether that's a laptop or a desktop, uh, you can feel free to type in any questions that you have or even just say hello in the chat menu on the right side or just below the screen where you're watching us. Uh, if you are um, on a mobile device like a smartphone or a laptop, uh, we, you can feel free to make sure that your phone is in portrait mode, which means that it's up and down. And if it is up and down in this portrait mode, there should be a chat menu that appears just below the video. Um, while you are uh, able to see and hear me, hopefully pretty clearly, uh, it is uh, delayed. So when I'm speaking, when I'm talking to you through this platform, it's about 20 or 25 seconds before you actually hear the words that came out of my mouth. So when you send me a chat, it'll be about 20 to 25 seconds after uh, I said the words uh, that I will be able to see it. Uh, but the chat is fairly instantaneous, so when I see a question, I will try and answer it as quickly as possible. Also, if you're chatting with someone else in the chat, uh, this will be pretty instantaneous. And obviously, this is specifically during the webinar. So if you are watching on YouTube at our YouTube channel at youtube.com, forward slash free geek mothership. Uh, you have a few more options as, 
you can feel free to pause and uh, re-watch the video at any time. Uh, you can also, if you're on a smartphone, if you tap twice on the right side, that means you go tap, tap, uh, you will fast forward by about 10 seconds. And if you tap twice on the right side, uh, oh, sorry. If you tap twice on the right side, that will fast forward by 10 seconds. If you tap twice on the left side, that will rewind by 10 seconds. So you can re-watch or re-listen to something that I was talking about. Uh, you can feel free to pause, and even during this live webinar, if you want to pause, you can feel free to pause it. And then when you resume, uh, when you hit the play button again, it'll come through and you will be able to continue listening to whatever's happening. Uh, if, again, you are watching afterwards on our YouTube channel, feel free to leave any comments and we'll answer them as soon as we can. All right, and so with all of that being said, let's go ahead and jump into our video on how to set up your free geek computer. Uh, again, feel free to please ask any questions that you might have. I will be available in the chat to answer as many questions as you have. If you don't have any questions and you just want to say hi, that's great too. I would love to hear from you. All right, here we go. All right, and welcome to the first pre-recorded session of this webinar. The first thing that we're going to be doing is we are going to be going through the system configuration of your FreakBox or FreakTop. Now, some of you might have already done this, and that's totally fine. Just hang tight. We're going to go through this a little bit fast, just because, again, there might be some people who have already done this. If you are watching this after we've already hosted our webinar, you can feel free to pause the video at any time or skip ahead. Do whatever is necessary for you to be able to get the most out of this tutorial. Remember, if you're on a mobile device like a smartphone, you can double tap the screen on the right side to skip ahead by 10 seconds, and you can double tap on the screen on the left side to go backwards by 10 seconds. This is really useful if you want to skip ahead of this section or if you need to go back and rehear something that we've already mentioned. After this webinar is over, you can rewatch this video on our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash free geek mothership. Just as a heads up, the first part of this video might be a little bit grainy and I apologize for that. That's due to the way in which we're recording. Once we get onto the desktop of our computer, the video recording should get much, much better and we should be able to see things much easier. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. When you first turn on your machine, the first thing you'll see is the system configuration and you'll need to choose the language. You can scroll down using the mouse wheel or scroll back up to find a different language. There's also this bar on the right hand side where you can press the left mouse button and drag down or up to find the language that is going to suit you best. I'm going to use English, but feel free to use whichever language is best for you. Once you've selected the language, you'll see that it is highlighted in green. So make sure that you have the correct language selected for you and then go down to the right hand corner and using the left mouse button, click continue. Next, you'll be asked about your keyboard layout. All of the freak boxes and freak tops that you get from FreeGeek will come with this standard US keyboard layout. So for this section, we can go ahead and ignore it and just click on the continue button again with our left mouse button. So this screen is actually one that you will only see if you have the option to connect to the internet using Wi-Fi. Usually this means that you have a laptop, but there are some desktops that do have the ability to use Wi-Fi. Because of how FreeGeek prepared the computer for you to be able to use, we don't want to connect to a Wi-Fi network right now. So we're going to make sure that that setting is selected with the little green circle and another tiny white dot in the middle. And then we are going to click on the continue button. We will be connecting to Wi-Fi later, so don't worry about that. There's just a, one more thing that we have to do before our Wi-Fi connection will work properly. Next up, we'll need to select our time zone. I know that I'm in the Los Angeles time zone because I live in Portland, Oregon. If you live in a different time zone, you may need to move this pin by clicking on a section, using your left mouse button, or by typing in a city. You'll see that if I type in Portland, Oregon, I do have the option to select it using my left mouse button. And you'll see that the pin moved to the Los Angeles time zone. I can click anywhere else to get rid of that menu and then click on the continue button when I'm ready. 
Here you'll need to give a little bit of information either about yourself or you can give a fake name if you want as well. Either one works for Linux Mint since this information is only stored on your machine. If I type in FreeGeek as my name, we'll see that the computer name and the username are automatically filled out. If you don't like the way that either of these names look, you can feel free to left click in the box and press the backspace key to delete them and then type in your own computer name. You can also change your username, again by left-clicking in the box, holding the backspace key, and typing in a new name. And finally, we have our password section. When we go to start typing in numbers and letters, you'll notice that the characters are blacked out. This is for privacy reasons, so you won't be able to see what you're typing, but you will have to know exactly what it is in order to be able to log into your computer. You'll also see that Linux Mint is giving us an indication that the password I've typed in is really short and the red color is to indicate that it's not a very good password. If I start typing in a random assortment of numbers and letters, you'll see that eventually my password goes from a short password to a strong password. Now the problem with all these random numbers and letters is that I have no idea what I just typed in so I won't know how to be able to log into my computer. So I'm gonna delete this by using the backspace key. And so I need to choose a strong secure password for my computer that no one else will know, but also is something that I can easily remember. Every year, a company called NordPass releases the top 20 or top 200 most commonly used passwords. Some of the most common ones include 1234561234567891, password 1111111123123 qwerty abc123000000 i love you password 1 qqww1122 these are very common passwords and are very easy to guess and so we don't recommend using any of these but a password doesn't have to be complicated instead what we recommend is actually a passphrase I love you is actually a phrase, but it's so common that we don't recommend using it. You can also add a couple of numbers and an exclamation point at the end to make it a little bit more secure. For example, if I use plug into Portland 24 seven exclamation point, we can see that this is a strong password and plug into Portland 24 seven is fairly easy for me to remember. Now, I don't recommend that you use this specific passphrase, but you should pick one that's good for you and one that you can incorporate some numbers and even a special character like an exclamation point, a question mark, or an, an and symbol, percent sign. Any of those are great options. Once you've come up with a good passphrase, you'll need to type it in again in the confirm password section. Just left click on the box and type the passphrase in again. Now you'll notice that if I type it in wrong, Linux Mint will automatically tell me to make sure that I'm definitely typing in the exact phrase that I want to type in. Now, since I don't know where I messed up, I'm just gonna hold the backspace key, delete all of this information that I just typed in, and try again. Once I type it in correctly, I'll get this nice little check mark saying, hey, you've typed your passwords in right. You're good to go. And then finally, we've got a couple of options here. We can tell our computer that we want to log in automatically, meaning that you won't need to use your password in order to log into your computer. But we really don't recommend this because then anyone has access to your computer. So instead, we recommend making sure that the require my password to log in option is selected. Just make sure that the little dot is green and has another tiny little dot on the inside. Once you've got this, go ahead and click continue. Then your computer will go through a, a little bit of setup to make sure that everything is set up properly, both from FreeGeek and from the information that you just provided. And once it's done, we'll need to restart our computer. This should only take a couple of minutes at most. So just sit tight and wait until it's done. And while we wait, we are going to cut back to live Tom so that he can give us some information on why free. 
All right, so that is uh, setting up our computer. So uh, while we wait, uh, I want to go through a little bit of vocabulary uh, and just kind of talk a little bit more about the computer that you're running as well as uh, just some additional information. So the first thing I want to talk about is what is the difference between hardware and software? So uh, generally hardware is the uh, parts of the computer that you can actually touch. So like your monitor, your keyboard, your mouse, as well as the insides of the computer. Uh, whereas software is tends to be what you actually see on your screen. So these are programs, uh, typically like applications uh, that are, allow you to interact with your computer in a certain way. So that might be something like your internet browser or a calculator or a messaging software, anything like that is considered to be software. So again, hardware is the physical components of your computer and software is the uh, more uh, kind of loose programs that, that you'll actually be able to interact with while you're using your computer. Uh, so next I want to talk about an operating system. So an operating system is actually a piece of software. So uh, the, the operating system is what allows you as a user of your computer to interact with your computer, uh, interact with the hardware of computers so that you can do the things that you want to do. So again, if we're talking about something like a calculator, uh, the operating system allows you to uh, open up the calculator program, type in one plus one, press the enter key, and then your computer, the hardware, actually knows that you are trying to do this math, this one plus one equation, and then it'll do that math for you, and then it'll output a result in that one in which that you can understand. So that is the role of the operating system to bridge the communication between you, the user, and uh, the hardware that you have at, that you're trying to use. Now, all of the uh, machines that we give out through our programs, whether that's Plug Into Portland or Welcome to Computers or Gift a Geek Box, these uh, all come with the software called Linux Mint or the operating system called Linux Mint. This is uh, your operating system and your distribution. So some other examples of operating systems would be the Windows 10 operating system and uh, the Mac OS operating system that comes on Apple computers. Uh, Linux Mint is just kind of another version of that. Now, uh, Linux has is actually a uh, what's called a kernel, which we'll talk about that later. Uh, but essentially, there's different versions uh, of operating systems that all use uh, this Linux core, this Linux kernel. Uh, and Mint is one of those different versions. Uh, there's also things like Ubuntu. Um, there is uh, Arch Linux. Uh, Red Hat and a whole bunch of others. Um, so kind of talking about why we decided to use Linux Mint, uh, one of the big things is that we find that it's really easy to use in comparison to some of the others. Uh, it just kind of tends to do the things that we expect it to do when we expect it to do it. So that's kind of number one why we've been using Linux Mint for the last several years. Now, one other main feature of uh, Linux Mint is that it is free and open source software. We'll talk about what that means, but uh, for starters, uh, it's free. So that means that uh, we as a nonprofit are able to give you a high quality computer and one that allows you to do the things that you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with uh, a, a cost that, that doesn't have to be uh, something that you have to pay for. Uh, this also means that you can go and download Linux Mint for free on their website and install it on any computer that you need uh, to have a, to try and give either a second life or um, just kind of get back up and running again. Now, the most common operating system is Windows 10. And so what that ends up meaning is that a lot of people are trying to hack into Windows 10 to try and steal your information. Uh, and the Mac OS operating system that comes on Apple computers also tends to be a pretty high target. Linux users tend to be a much, much smaller group of people in general. So 
it tends to be a lot harder and a lot less more uh, infrequent that viruses can actually make it onto your computer and can uh, harm you or uh, harm your machine. Now, the other great benefit uh, of the fact that it's open source, meaning that anyone can come in and look at the source code of the machine, can also find any potential issues with the operating system and send them to the developing team of Linux Mint and then they can try and patch those issues to make sure again that it's even harder for you to get viruses. So those are some of the, the main reasons why we at FreeGeek tend to use Linux Mint for uh, any of the machines that we give away as well as any of the machines that we're using on site to uh, do any of the work that we need to do. So talking about FOSS, again, FOSS stands for free and open source software. So uh, again, free is, is fairly straightforward. It, it doesn't cost any money. Uh, but the, the open source software part is the part where it's, it's kind of confusing uh, just because not all software is open source. So what open source means is that if you have the, the know-how, you are able to open up the source code, the programming that, is, that makes up the operating system, and you can look at exactly what is happening at any given time. Now this allows uh, anyone who has a strong technical background to uh, make sure that uh, this section of the software is safe it's safe for the users, it's safe for uh, the developers, it's safe for everyone to be using. Uh, and if they find something that's wrong, they can propose a change. And then that change can be adopted by the Linux Mint team or the community. Uh, and then that vulnerability or that uh, bug, that issue, can be fixed up quickly. And so what this means is that uh, when compared to something like Windows 10, which has a uh, what is essentially a very large team of developers working on it, it's still not the same number of uh, just enthusiasts who can look at the Linux Mint software or the, the source code of Linux in general. And so the, the rate of development and the rate of uh, bug fixes can be changed much, much faster on a Linux operating system than on something like Windows 10. So you tend to get uh, fixes for giant malware uh, breaches much faster, uh, and so it just tends to be what we consider to be a, a safer option for using a computer. And then again, software is, is generally just the program that allows you to interact with your machine. So free and open source software means that it's a free program that allows you to interact with your hardware, and you, if you want to, can open up the source code, source code the programming language, that allows you to actually see what that software looks like uh, and actually understand what's happening as well as change it at any time. There's a little bit more that goes into open source, but that's, that's kind of the main benefit. All right, and so with that, we are gonna go ahead and jump into how to use your FreeGeek computer. Uh, again, this is using Linux Mint, so it's using the free and open source software that we were just talking about. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, ask us in the chat, and I will try and get to those as soon as I can. All right, I'll see you on the other side of this video. All right, and welcome to the first pre-recorded session of this webinar. The first thing that we're going to be doing is we are going to be going through the system configuration of your FreakBox or FreakTop. Now, some of you might have already done this, Ha! Ah, technical glitches. This is what happens when you run your first webinar. I played the wrong video. I'm sorry. Let me play the correct video. Okay, so our computer has nearly finished setting itself up, but we want to do one last thing, especially if you're using a freak top that you got from FreeGeek. Again, a freak top is a laptop that came from FreeGeek. That last thing that we want to do is we want to actually restart our computer. The reason that we did not connect to Wi-Fi earlier was because there are some settings that can be a little weird, and so we want to make sure that those settings are all set properly, and the way in which we do this is we restart our computer. 
If you've been having issues with your Wi-Fi and you've already gone through the system configuration but have not restarted your computer, that's the first thing that we'll recommend doing. If you're still having issues with your Wi-Fi, there may be some other things that we can check a little bit later. To restart our computer, I'm going to go up to the top right hand corner of our screen with my cursor and I'm going to select the quit option. I'm going to do this by using the left mouse button and then I'm going to select quit again with the left mouse button. Here I'll have two options. I can shut down my computer or restart. I want to be able to log in and use my computer right now, so I'm just going to restart. Again, I'm going to do that by using the left mouse button. Okay, and once our computer has restarted, we are finally ready to log in. I'm going to go to the Free Geek user, which I created earlier, click in the password box with my left mouse button, and type in the password I created in the system configurator. Once I've done that, I can use the Enter key on my keyboard to log in. Okay, we are now logged into our computer. So, before we do anything else, I do want to go over a little bit of vocabulary, just so that you are well aware of, if I say desktop, you'll know what I'm talking about. If I talk about the panel, you'll know about that. And then after I kind of go through this vocabulary, we'll get started up with our Wi-Fi settings so that those of you who are using laptop computers can follow along with some of the other things. And then we will go through just kind of some general setup of our computer and we will get everything uh, good to go. So the first thing that we want to talk about is that this is our desktop. This entire thing that we are seeing right now is our desktop. The first thing that pops up on our desktop is this welcome screen. This is in what is called a window. A window is something that we can usually drag around with using our left mouse button to click and hold the top bar using our left mouse button and drag it around. If we look on the left side here, we have a few different things that we're going to go through in a little bit. But before we get to that, let's check out some of the other sections of our desktop. Up in the top left corner of our screen, we have this computer and home folders. Uh, these are launchers. On a Windows computer, this will often be called uh, desktop icons or shortcuts or something like that. These essentially will launch new windows that can take us to our home directory or to a computer folder. If I use my left mouse button to double click, which means that I am clicking twice or I'm pressing the button twice very quickly, I will open one of these launchers and here I will find a few different things. You can see that there's another window that pops up. This is my home directory. This is where I'll find a few different things like my documents, my downloads, music, pictures, and other things that I might be saving here. Just as a quick reminder, if you are following along with this video, you are able to pause it at any time, whether you're watching live with us or if you're watching after the webinar has already happened, you can feel free to pause it at any time as well. Now, since I am doing this section of our webinar pre-recorded, uh, you'll see that actually this file right here is going to be uh, what is my recording, the thing that I'm actually recording right now while I am speaking. To close this window, I have this uh, X icon, which is the close icon in the top right hand corner of the screen. So I can left click on it to close this home directory. And now I want to talk about our panel. This is sometimes called the taskbar for a Windows based computer or a dock for an Apple based computer. And this is this bar that is at the bottom of our screen. On the left hand side, I'll have a few different uh, pictures which are called icons. These act very, very similarly to the launchers that we have on our desktop in that I can click on them and then something will happen. The first thing is this file folder here. If I click on this with my left mouse button, I will see the same home directory that I was just looking at when I used the home launcher, the home directory launcher on my desktop. I also have this orange button here, which is for Firefox, which is the built-in web browser with Linux Mint. 
This will launch Firefox. And the other really important one for us to see is this uh, LM symbol. This icon is for our menu. In our menu, we'll have a few different things to go through, so I'm going to save that for a little bit later. But just know that here we will find all of the applications that are installed on our computer. I do have one other icon on the left-hand side, and that is for the OBS Studio program that I'm using to pre-record this video. So if you're following along, you will not have this symbol. Just know that it, it doesn't mean anything for you. It's just because I am recording this video. If we skip on over to the right-hand side of our panel, we'll see that I have another set of icons. These are not launchers, though. These are called applets. Usually, applets will let us do quick system configuration for our computer, like things like adjusting the volume, or adjusting our clock, or doing updates, uh, connecting to a Bluetooth device, like some Bluetooth headphones, or a Bluetooth controller. You'll notice that some of these are applets that you have on your computer, and I also will have a few other applets visible. For example, I have a printer applet. So I have a printer connected to this computer, which I can click on and connect to that printer at any time. I also have the Bluetooth icon because my computer has Bluetooth capabilities. And then I have this symbol here, which uh, if you're paying really close attention, you might notice is the same symbol as we saw on, on the left side of my panel, which is for the OBS Studio program that I'm using to pre-record this video. So you won't have this OBS Studio, but you will have most of these others, if not all of them. All right, so with that vocabulary out of the way, we are going to go ahead and take a look at this welcome screen, this welcome window. So when I'm looking at this, the first thing that I'll notice is that there are two main sections. I've got the section in the middle here that has a whole bunch of words, text, which is, and this screen is, you know, just a welcome, a thanks from the Linux Mint team, uh, the team who created the Linux Mint operating system. And this section will actually change based on what we select on the left side of the window. This is called a navigation window or a navigation pane. You'll see that when I move my cursor, my mouse, up and down this pane, these titles will become highlighted. So if there's one that I want to check out, like this first steps, I can move my cursor, my mouse, over top of this first steps title and use my left mouse button to click on it. Here I'll have a few different settings that I can check out for my computer, like changing the uh, style of my computer from light mode to dark mode, I do this by checking, uh, this is called a toggle, meaning that there's a little button here that is going to switch from one side to the other, and then I can just leave it. Usually this means that there's only two options. In this case, there's a light mode and a dark mode. So I'm toggling between a dark mode, which I have selected now, and a light mode, which looks like this. I can also change my desktop colors. So let's say I wanted to have pink as my color. Then I can select pink and you'll notice that the green highlight changed to pink and that if I zoom out here, we actually have our launcher change from green to pink as well. Now I can select another color like yellow or gold or teal or dark blue or purple or I can go back to the default green. Choose whichever one works best for you. It's totally your preference. It doesn't affect how you use the computer. It just stylizes it in the way that is, is best for you and what you'd like to see. I think I'm gonna use this, uh, this pink color here for right now. All right, and now I'm gonna go ahead and check out some of these other settings. For example, we can check out the panel layout. So if I, uh, hover over using my mouse. Hovering means I'm not clicking on it. I'm just moving my cursor, my mouse, over top of these things. Then I, I have these two different options for traditional and modern. The default for Linux Mint is the modern theme, which means that there isn't a ton of information that we'll see on our panel. If we remember, our panel is the thing in the bottom of our desktop. So right now we've selected modern. So if I select traditional, let's see how our panel changes. 
So by selecting the traditional setting, we can see that now some words appeared next to the applications that I have open on my computer. So the first application is this welcome window, which we're going through right now. And we can see on our panel that the LM that was there before now has the words welcome next to it. You'll also notice that while I'm hovering over this, uh, this panel option here, this window, this program, you'll see a little preview up here of what it is that I'm actually looking at. We can also see that the OBS Studio icon ha now has the words OBS next to it. So as you have a large number of programs open, and if you're not super familiar with all of the different icons and what each of the little pictures mean, then you might want to have the traditional option enabled so that you actually see the words. It's like, oh, this is the welcome screen. Oh, this is my Firefox web browser. So it can be really helpful while you're starting to get familiar with Linux Mint, uh, but it's totally up to you if you would like to have the traditional, which has the words, or if you want to use the modern version of the panel. Okay, we have a few more things to go through in our welcome screen. So to do this, I can either use my mouse wheel, which is the rounded section in the middle of my mouse. Not all mice have a mouse wheel, but if yours does, you can scroll that wheel towards you, meaning you use your finger to roll the wheel towards you, and you will scroll down. And then you can also, if you want to scroll up, uh, use that same mouse wheel to roll up or roll away from you. Usually that's towards the monitor of your screen. So you can roll up and down. Now I have a mouse because I'm using a desktop computer. If you do not have a mouse and instead you're using something like a trackpad on a laptop, this can be a little bit harder. Depending on the laptop, you might be able to use two fingers to push or pull uh, the window uh, to scroll it up and down. Sometimes you might have to be on the very, very right hand side of your trackpad. This is especially true with Dell computers, uh, but sometimes it's just really confusing and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So if you are either trying to use a mouse or trying to use a trackpad and neither of these options are working for you to scroll up or down, we can actually hover over on the right hand side and it's kind of hard to see here, but there's this extra little bar here that's a little bit different color than the rest of the screen. This is called a scroll bar. So if I want to scroll down, what I want to do is I want to move this bar down. The way in which I do that is I use the left mouse button and I click and hold. So that means that I'm holding down the left mouse button and I'm not letting go. And then I'm just going to pull my mouse down and we can see that the entire window is now scrolling down. If I need to scroll up, I can again go over to this bar, click and hold with my left mouse button and drag up. Now we're going to skip a few of these things for right now because not everyone is currently connected to the internet, which we wanna make sure that we do before we try and do some of these other settings. So I'm actually just going to close this welcome window. Now, every time you log into your computer, you will see this welcome window, so you will get to see it again. However, if you don't want it to appear every time that you log in, you can click on this little tiny checkbox in the bottom right-hand corner of the window where it says, show this dialog at startup. Right now it's checked, which is uh, shown by my highlight color, which is pink. I can click on this and we'll notice that it changes to white instead of the pink color. This means that it is unchecked, meaning that when I log in, it will not show this dialog at startup, meaning that I won't see the welcome screen when I log in next time. It's up to you if you want to see this window next time you log in. I do, so I'm just going to leave this checked just in case I wanna come back and check out some of these first steps again to make sure that I've done everything. But for right now, we are actually all done with this screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the close button and you'll notice that my close button has changed from green to pink again, because I chose my highlight color. If I scroll up, I change my highlight color to pink. So that means that my close icon is now also pink.
All right, it is time to connect to the Wi-Fi. Now, if you're using a desktop computer, you might not have Wi-Fi capabilities, and that's totally fine. If you're on a laptop, though, you will definitely want to have Wi-Fi. Kind of the whole point of a laptop is to be able to take it places or to move it around the house or uh, to go to a library and be able to use your computer in a place that is not always where a desktop would normally live. So to do this, we are actually going to go to our applets, which are in the bottom right hand corner of our screen on our panel. And if we go down here, we'll see this icon that is two arrows pointing away from each other with a little tiny X. If you are connected to the internet using a wired ethernet cable, which is a cable that connects directly from your computer to a router where your internet comes in from your service provider, whether that's Xfinity or CenturyLink or another internet provider, you will see a different symbol. And that is uh, a symbol with three boxes with little wires or cables connecting them to symbolize that you are connected with a wired internet connection. Since my computer is not connected with an ethernet cable and I am not connected to any Wi-Fi signals or any wireless internet signals, I currently have no internet on this computer. So to fix that, what I want to do is use my cursor to click on the no internet connection. And here I'll get a list of all of the Wi-Fi signals that my computer can currently see. Now again, this is only if you have a laptop or a computer that has the ability to use Wi-Fi. If your computer does not have the ability to use Wi-Fi, you will see something that's a little bit different. And if you're connected using an, a wired connection, an ethernet connection, then you don't need to mess with this at all. Now the flu network is my home internet. This is what I have at my house. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the flu network. You'll notice that I have two different kinds though. I have the flu network and the flu network 5G. 5G is a little bit faster than the regular connection. So I'm going to use that 5G internet connection. To do this, I'm going to use my cursor to hover over the flu network 5G because that's the one that I want to use. And then I'm going to use my left mouse button to click on it. Now, if you are connecting to a Wi-Fi network, you will likely also have to type in a password. My home internet is protected with a password. And by default, uh, whenever you receive a Wi-Fi router from your internet service provider like Xfinity or CenturyLink, then those will also be automatically protected by a password. If you've gone in and changed some of the settings like change the password setting, the password that is listed on your router that is physically on a sticker printed on the side of your router is probably not accurate anymore. But if this is the first time you've set up your router and you're also setting up your computer at the same time, or maybe you haven't had time to go and change the password for your router, then you should be able to find that password listed on the sticker on the side of your router. Since I have changed the password of my router, I'm going to type in that password into this password box. So when I go to type in my password, you'll notice that it does have all of these little dots here, symbolizing that I've typed in characters. But if I hit show password, you'll see that I've typed in just the word hello. But I'm doing this as a demonstration because if you're ever typing in your password and someone else can see you, sometimes just the dots isn't quite secure enough. So what I'm going to do, because I'm going to be showing a little bit of information about my personal internet and the password that's being used there, I'm actually just going to blur this window out so that you can't see the password that I'm typing in because it's my own personal password. Once I've typed in my password, which again, you can't see because I've blurred it out, I'm going to use my left mouse button to go to the connect button in the bottom right corner of this window. And after a brief moment, and actually it looks like I took too long, so I'm gonna go ahead and try this again. So I'm going to left click on the no network icon, or excuse me, the no network applet, go up to the flu network 5G, type in my password, and click connect with my left mouse button. 
And after a minute, we'll see in the top right corner of my screen, I have the connection established window appear. This means that I should now be connected to the internet. To test this, I'm going to use the Mozilla Firefox web browser. Again, this is the browser that is installed by default with Linux Mint. If you have uh, another computer from us, sometimes it might come with Google Chrome. If that's your preferred web browser, that's totally fine. Either Google Chrome or Firefox will work for testing our internet connection. So I'm going to open the Firefox web browser, which is pinned to the left side of my panel. So I'm going to hover over it with my mouse, then use the left mouse button to click. And then I'm going to go to the address bar, which is at the very top of our screen. We'll talk a little bit about the Firefox web browser in a little bit. But for right now, I'm just going to click on this address bar here. And when I do that, we'll see that the entire uh, page or the entire link, the text up here is highlighted so that I can begin typing and change it. I'm going to go to freegeek.org and press the enter key on my keyboard. And here I can see that I have been able to make it to the Free Geek website. This is a good thing because if I was not connected to the internet, then I would not have been able to do this. So the fact that I was able to make it to freegeek.org means that my internet should be working properly and I'm all ready for the next steps. I'm going to close this window now by going to the top right hand corner of my screen and clicking the close button. And with that, I am now ready for the next major step, which is to make sure that my computer is totally up to date. If I go again down to the bottom right hand corner of my screen where my applets are found, I will find the little shield icon that has a tiny little dot next to it. This is our update manager. So we are going to left click on the update manager applet using our mouse. And that will open a window where we are now going to be able to update our computer. Here we'll be able to install all the updates for our computer to make sure that we are safe and secure and that all the software that we are going to install is working properly. To do this, or to move on, I'm going to click the OK button, which we can find at the bottom of our update manager with the left mouse button. I'm going to click. And then we'll, the first thing I'm seeing is that the update manager is actually not up to date itself. So it needs to do a little bit of work to make sure that it is ready to give us all of the most recent and current updates. I'm going to click on the apply update button, which I can find in the middle of the update manager. And again, I'm going to use the left mouse button. And it wants to know my password which is confusing, especially since it says Synaptic. Well, I didn't have the Synaptic program open, so what is this? Synaptic is uh, the, the tool that Linux uses to install all of the programs or uh, bits of information that they call packages into our computer. So it's actually not surprising to see Synaptic pop up and request our password in order to be able to do anything related to updating our computer. So to do this, I need to type in my password that I used for, to create my account, which if you remember when I set up my computer was plug into Portland 24 seven. Again, your passphrase is probably different. And in fact, it should be different, but hopefully you still remember what that passphrase is because it will be really important in order for you to be able to use your computer. So I'm gonna type in my password And then instead of there being an OK button, they have this authenticate button, which basically means that it's going to accept our password and then move on with the next steps. So I'm going to click on this authenticate button. And the update manager is going to do a little bit of work. And then once it's done updating itself, it will give us a list of all of the different updates that are available for our computer. All right, so this screen is actually a little small for my taste. So what I want to do so that I can see all of the information is I'm going to resize this window. 
The way in which I'm going to do that is to move my cursor and hover over one of the edges. And we'll see that it goes from my, my cursor and it changes to this little arrow with a line. And that means that I can actually click and drag this window to make it bigger. If I go up to the top side of my window, we'll see that the line actually moves to the top of the arrow and that it points up. That means that I can drag it up. And then if I go to one of the corners, we can see that it changes from a line to a corner, which is still technically a line, but this means that we can click and drag and we can actually resize this window both uh, horizontally, left and right, and vertically, up and down. So I can do this to get the exact size that works for me. I can also resize uh, what I'm seeing in this section of the window here, but the icon I'll get on my uh, cursor is a little bit different. So if I go down, we can see that it changes from the single arrow to an arrow that has an arrowhead on both sides. This means that I can drag this section up and down. So in order to do that, I'm going to left click and drag up or down. And now I can see a lot more things. So to recap all of that, which was a lot of information. If I move my cursor to the left side of a window, it'll change, my cursor will change to this arrow with a line that allows me to drag the window left and right. It'll, I can also do this to the top of my window to drag it up and down. I can do this in the corner where instead of an arrow with a line, I get a little corner icon, which I can use to resize the whole thing at the same time. And then if I want to resize one section within the window that I'm in, which is the update manager window, my icon will be this little arrow with two heads or two pointers. And that means that I can drag this one section of the window to resize it within the entire container that is our update manager. All right, so we need to look at the updates. So all of these programs that are listed here are all things that are going to be updated when I go to install the updates for my computer. Now I can see that there's a bunch here, but if I look at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, I can see that my computer is saying that there are 75 updates selected. But I'm only seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine updates. All of the others are actually down, and I need to scroll down in order to see them. So if you remember, if I'm using a mouse, which I currently am, I have a scroll wheel in the middle of my mouse, which is a little rounded section which I can pull towards me to scroll down or I can push away from me to scroll up. I also have a scroll bar on the right hand side which I can drag down using the left mouse button to click and hold rather than clicking and releasing. And this allows me to drag this bar up and down and I can see all of the different updates that are going to be installed. Now this is important because I might want to go through and check some of these updates that could potentially cause uh, some issues with my computer. Normally this isn't a problem, but say for example, we know that the, the version 87 of Firefox is something that has a problem, or we currently like the current version of Firefox that we're using, so we don't wanna update to Firefox 87. Then what we can do is we can uncheck this box here and we can actually, if I move down, you'll see that the box has changed from having a pink check into being empty. And this means that once, once I go to install these updates, it will not install the Firefox 87 update. Now there's actually nothing wrong with Firefox 87. And if we look at the left-hand side here, we see the shield icon, meaning that this is a security update so this Firefox 87 is actually improving the security of our computer, and it's not something that we want to skip out on. So I'm going to check this box using my left mouse button to make sure that I install that update. 
If I grab my scroll bar on the right hand side with my left mouse button and drag down, we can see that I start to hit some other different types of updates. The shield icon again is for security updates, but this lightning bolt icon, this picture, is for the kernel update. The kernel is kind of like the core of our computer and is, is a lot of the uh, code and programming language that allows our hardware of our computer to interact with the operating system, the Linux Mint thing that we see as our computer and use day to day. So this can be really important and often will help improve performance as well as security. Uh, so these are really important to make sure that you stay up to date with the latest Linux kernels. And the next thing that we have is this little circle with an up arrow. These are software updates. And so these are uh, updates for the programs and software that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So as I scroll down I can see all of these different types of things and all of these are things that we want to actually have installed but if you were to see something that you're saying hey I don't want to update that I'm happy with how it's working right now I don't need that installed you can always uncheck that box and then recheck it when you're ready to install it later. Again, we want to install all of these updates, so I'm gonna leave everything checked, and I'm going to use my cursor to go up to the Install Updates button, which is at the very top of our Update Manager, and I'm going to left click. Sometimes you might get an extra window that says this upgrade will trigger additional changes. These are usually things that are totally fine to install, and are just other extra little files that weren't listed in the update manager but are very very important for everything to be working properly. So to continue I'm just going to use my cursor to go down to the OK button and left click. Again we see this synaptic uh, package manager asking us for our password to make sure that we are absolutely positive that we want to install these updates and that we as the owner of the computer are are giving permission to our computer to do this. So I'm going to type in my password for my computer, which again for me is plug into Portland 24 seven. And then I'm going to press the enter key to get the authenticate window to accept my password. Now, depending on your internet connection and the speed of your computer, downloading and installing these updates could take a couple minutes. It could take an hour. It, it depends on a lot of different factors. So if you are currently installing updates for your computer or are about to install updates for your computer, this might be a good time for you to stop. Uh, you can also feel free to ask us any questions. Remember that uh, real Tom, live Tom, is uh, in the chat and he's able to answer any questions that you might have, whereas this pre-recorded uh, video is not going to be able to answer any specific questions. So if you have any questions, now would be a good time to ask them. Or if you want to just wait and see uh, how your computer responds to the updates before we can move forward, then feel free to go ahead and pause the video right now. I'm gonna speed up my updates real quick just so you don't have to sit through mine. Again, please feel free to pause this video at any time. All right, and once our updates have been installed, we will see that this orange banner appears at the very top of our update manager that says reboot required. If you wanna restart your computer now, you are welcome to do so. I'm gonna wait on my restart, on my reboot, just because I'm recording this video and so it'll be a little bit easier for me to be able to continue recording and do the last few things that I wanna show you before doing my reboot. But it is really important that you restart your computer just so that all of the updates that you've installed are handled properly. All right, so for now, I'm going to close this update manager again by going to the left-hand corner of our screen, the, le the upper, sorry, not the left-hand corner, the right-hand corner of our screen and using the left mouse button to click on the close icon. 
All right, so everything that we've been doing so far has been while using our uh, applets in the bottom right corner of our screen. But I wanna show you the menu now where it has all of the programs that we have installed on our computer and that are available to use. To get to our menu, we're gonna use our mouse and go down to the bottom right hand, or sorry, the bottom left hand corner of our screen to this Linux Mint logo, the little picture here. If I hover over it, it says menu. That helps me know that I'm in the right place. And I'm going to use the left mouse button to click on this Linux Mint logo. When I do this, I will get the menu. And so in this menu, I have a few different things that are important. On the left hand side, I have my favorites section. And so these are all the programs that are commonly used. We'll come back to this in a little bit because there are actually some really important things for us to know. You'll also notice that in the bottom right hand corner of our menu, uh, we have uh, the words changing as I hover over a new icon. This is telling us exactly what program it is that I'm hovering over so that I don't get confused necessarily or so that I, I can help, it can help me to figure out exactly what it is that I'm looking at before I actually click on it. The next section that I want to show you is right here in the middle. This is a set of categories where we might find very specific programs. Right now I'm on all applications because that's where my mouse is hovering over. So I have access to all of the applications on the rightmost side of my menu. But if I hover over the, let's say the internet section, we'll see that I only have a few different programs that appear. We'll see a familiar one, our Firefox web browser, but we also have the Thunderbird mail client where we can connect our email that we have with something like Gmail or Outlook or Proton or any other uh, email that we, we have, we can connect to Thunderbird and instead of going to that website, we can receive our email through this program. I can also go to the office category where I'll find all of the LibreOffice programs. LibreOffice is the open source alternative to the Microsoft Office Suite. So Writer is the equivalent to Microsoft Word. Impress is like Microsoft PowerPoint. Calc is like Excel. Uh, so we have all of these different programs which can be really, really useful, especially since the Microsoft Office Suite will not work on Linux Mint. And we'll uh, talk about other uh, free and open source programs that you can install here in a little bit. But just as a general rule of thumb, uh, most programs that are designed for Windows or uh, Apple-based computers will not work on Linux Mint. And so you will need to install a, an open source alternative. All right, and the last and most important thing that I wanna show you in this menu is the all application section and the search bar at the very top. So if I click in this search bar, using my left mouse button again, I can begin to type in a program that I want to search for. Let's say I'm looking for the Firefox web browser. I can begin typing in Firefox, and you'll see that all I have to type in is the word fire, and I actually end up with two different things, the Firefox web browser, as well as the firewall configuration screen. Firewall is uh, kind of like an antivirus type uh, program that that helps keep your computer safe from, from internet traffic that you don't want uh, affecting your computer. I can hit the backspace key to back up here. I can also start searching for other programs. Like let's say I want to search for the update manager. I can start typing update manager and we actually have that appear as soon as I start typing the U, the P and the D uh, for update. So this can be a really, really powerful tool if you want to quickly find a program and you're not sure what section it's in um, but you know that it's in there and you don't want to scroll through the giant list of all applications. If we go over to the all applications section and I go over to the final column here on the, on the rightmost side, we see that we actually have the scroll bar here. And if I start pulling down using my left mouse button, we'll see that I actually have a very large number of programs installed. Now, if there's one of these programs that I think I'm going to be seeing and using quite a bit, then what I might want to do is either pin this to my panel so that I can get at it frequently or keep it as a favorite. Let's say, for example, I do a lot of writing. 
and I want to make sure that I am able to access LibreOffice Writer as often as possible. To do this, I'm going to find the LibreOffice Writer program, and then instead of left-clicking, which if I were to left-click, it would open the program, and I can demonstrate that now. So this is LibreOffice Writer. Now if I know that I want to use LibreOffice Writer frequently, then what I can do is I can open my menu, again by going to the left corner of our screen, clicking on the menu icon, finding the LibreOffice Writer program. And you can see that it's taking me a while to scroll down here. I can right click on this, so I'm going to use the rightmost button on my mouse. And then I get a few different options. I have the Add to Panel, Add to Desktop, Add to Favorites, and Uninstall. Now, uninstalling is obviously the thing that I don't want to do right now because that will remove LibreOffice Writer from my computer. But let's say I want to add it to my panel. If I click on this box here, we can see that my menu icons, my uh, programs here, actually kind of got shuffled around. So if I close this window, this LibreOffice Writer, normally what would happen is this icon would disappear. But now we can see that LibreOffice Writer now has a permanent home on my panel. So to open the LibreOffice Writer again, I can go down to the LibreOffice Writer icon and use my left mouse button to open it. Now this can be faster than me going to the menu going to the uh, office category, the writer section, uh, it's up to you. The other thing that I can do if I right click is I can add this to my desktop. Now at first it doesn't look like anything's changed, but again if I close this window, we can now see that I have LibreOffice Writer on my desktop. So that's cool. Again, just like the launcher that's on my panel, I can click on this although I will have to use the double click function using my mouse, so I will click twice very, very uh, rapidly, I will open up LibreOffice Writer. All right, and so that's pretty much it for our menu here. So the next thing that I want to show you is how to install new programs. So let's say you, you need a program that's not currently installed on your computer. To do this, we want the software manager. So I can go up to my all applications and go into my search bar and start typing in software manager. And we'll see that it appears right here on the rightmost side of my menu. And if we pay very, very close attention, we'll actually see that this icon, this picture, is also over here on our left-hand side. And if I hover over this picture, we'll see that the words at the bottom right-hand corner of my menu say Software Manager. So that's cool. That's what I wanted to see. So I'm going to left-click on my Software Manager to open the Software Manager window. Now the Software Manager is a really, really cool uh, app store type of program that allows you to install free and open source software that is definitely going to be compatible with your Linux Mint computer. So all of the programs that you will find here uh, in the Software Manager are free, as well as open source, which we've already talked about the benefits of uh, an open source program. So I'm not gonna get into that right now, but you can see that we have a few different options. Uh, these editor's picks will change every time you open up this program. You can see things like Steam, which is a gaming platform where you can uh, purchase and play games. Uh, you can also uh, see something like Skype, or you will see Audacity, which is a program that allows you to edit audio. And if you don't see something that you're looking for, you can start to search for something like, say, games or office or internet. We have all these different categories here that allow you to really kind of dial in exactly the program that you're looking for. So if I go to games, we'll see that I have a few different options here, but let's say I know exactly what game it is that I'm looking for, and I don't want to scroll through all of these. 
Well, what I can do is use this search menu or the search bar up in the top right hand corner and I can type in the game that I'm looking for. Let's say I want to play Solitaire. And we'll see that some Solitaire based games immediately start to show up as something that I can install. I'm going to install this KPAT Solitaire Games. It has a pretty high review, so I can click here. And then I will be brought to the software manager description of what it is that, of this program that it is that I'm looking at potentially installing. If I use my scroll wheel or I grab the scroll bar to move up and down, I can get a bit more information. Here I'll see an example of what it is that I'm about to install. I can also get a few uh, bits of uh, technical details about what it is this program is. And if I keep going, I hit the review section, which talk about any potential issues with the software, anything that people have noticed that are a problem, uh, or uh, just in general, things that are going really, really well and uh, that this program works really well with. If I'm ready to install this solitaire, then I can go up to the install button in, up in the top right hand corner of my screen and use my left mouse button to click. Now before it can install anything, uh, it will ask for your password because again, it doesn't, your computer doesn't want to install anything that you as the owner of the computer don't want to have installed. So it will ask for your password, your computer password to confirm that you are ready to install this program. Again, my password, uh, I'm going to type it in. My passphrase is the plug into Portland passphrase. And then I can press the enter key to have the program accept my password. And then after it accepts my password and I've typed it in correctly, we'll see that the software manager is now installing this program. Now, just as a quick reminder, just because you are installing a free and open source software does not mean that everything in this software will be free. For example, if we look at that Steam program that we were talking about earlier, you can purchase games to play. There are some free games that are available, but uh, a large part of the more popular games do cost money and you will have to pay for them. Another good example of this is the Spotify app. You can install Spotify onto your Linux Mint computer and be able to play Spotify, but you will get some ads unless you are paying for the Spotify premium account. So you will still get some functionality out of installing these programs, but you might not get the full functionality unless you are paying for the, uh, the program and making sure that you are up to date on your payments for that particular software. Now I'm just going to finish waiting for this program to install so that I can show you what it looks like after I've installed this program. Alright, and once we have finished installing this program, we can see that we have the remove button uh, appear in place of the install button. So if we ever want to uninstall this program, we can come to the, up, or to the software manager, find this program, and hit remove. Now if I'm ready to play Solitaire, what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to go find this program in my menu. So I'm going to go down to the menu, which is in the bottom left hand corner of my screen. Click on the menu. Now this is something that uh, is not going to be showing up in one of these folders necessarily. Um, we, we're not really sure exactly which one it's going to be in. Surprise, the game was installed into the games category. Uh, but let's say we didn't know that. We weren't really sure what it is that we're looking for. So one option is we could go to the all applications category and we could start to type in the program that we just installed. And if we start typing in KP, because uh, the program name is KPAT, uh, we actually will see that K Patience is the full title of the program. And down in the bottom right hand corner, we can see that this is a solitaire card game. So I can left click on K Patience. And now I have the game for, or now I have all these different versions of solitaire ready to be able to be played. I'm not going to play any solitaire right now, but uh, we can go ahead and get this up and running. So if I click on the Yukon version, we'll see that I'm, I'm ready to play solitaire. 
I'm going to go ahead and close this because I'm, I'm done with this program for now. And I can remove it again by clicking on this button. Or if I open up my menu and go to the games category and find K patients again, I can right click on it and uninstall it at any time. All right, we're almost done. So the last little bit of information that I want to show you is how to customize your computer. We already changed the folder icons from the default green to pink or whatever color it is that you decided that you wanted to use. But we can do even more than that. We can change our background. We can change the overall theme of our computer. So we want to go to our system preferences to do this. Now for our system preferences, uh, I'm gonna let you, if you're following along, try and find these system preferences on your own. I'm gonna give you about five seconds to pause the video and find this program on your own, and then I'm gonna show you where it is. All right, so if you are following along and you're able to find the system uh, preferences, uh, you'll know that you'll need to go to the menu and that you'll actually uh, need to go to the preferences category and scroll down until you find system settings. And I kept saying system preferences, uh, it's actually system settings, I apologize. So I'm gonna click on the system settings and we'll also see that the system settings is also on the left side here in our favorite section. So I can left click and now we're left with a bunch of different options. And in fact, if I use my mouse wheel to scroll down, we can see that there are a lot of different things that we can affect in this menu here. So if you're trying to change something about your computer uh, related to accessibility options or any other uh, major software changes to your computer that you want to affect, you can usually find them here in your system settings. Now, what we want to change are actually some pretty basic stuff. The first thing that we're going to want to change is our theme. So I'm going to click on the themes section or themes icon. And here we will be able to change how our computer looks. So uh, this icons section you'll notice is pink. This is actually the thing that we were changing earlier uh, in our welcome screen where we changed our folders from uh, pink or from green to pink. So I can click on the icons button here and I can change to any of these colors that look good for me, including a high contrast color. I have a, a, an old school looking folder here or I can keep it as the dark pink or uh, change it uh, to whatever color it is that I'm looking for. I'm going to change it to purple. I've decided that I want it to be purple now, so I'm going to change it to purple. And I'm going to change it to mint Y purple because I like the look of those icons a little bit more. But you'll notice that my uh, when we were changing the colors in our welcome screen, it changed not only our icons, but also our controls. So you can actually change how your controls look and have them different and separate and be a different color from your folders. So I'm going to select the, let's see, I'm going to select the orange, the mint Y dark orange, and we'll see that I actually have also enabled the dark mode for my menus. So if I go to the uh, controls again, if I look for mint Y darker orange, we'll see that I'm no longer in the dark mode but I can go to the dark orange and I'm in dark mode. Obviously this is a little bit confusing, but uh, I can also go to mint Y orange and now I am in the light mode. So for a lot of these colors, there will be a dark, a darker and a regular color for uh, pink, red, purple, gray, orange, or whatever color it is that you're looking for. I'm gonna keep mine orange and keep my folders purple. And now I've got a few other things that I can change. So I can change the mouse pointer. There aren't very many options here, but that's okay. I can also change my window borders. 
I can change to a dark theme or the mint Y or the mint X, whichever one is uh, good for me uh, and whichever one is good for you is the one that you should select. All right, and that is it for here. There are these two other sections here for adding and removing and some of the more settings, uh, but we're actually going to ignore these for right now and we are going to click on the back arrow on the top left corner of our system settings to go back to our main system settings window. So now I'm ready to change my background. So I'm going to click on the background section and we'll see that we're given a lot of different uh, options for the Linux Mint logo. So I'm going to drag this window out of the main screen here. I'm doing that by clicking and holding on the top portion of my window and moving it away. And now if I select this green color here, you can see that I now have a different background. Or that one. Or this one. But these are all Linux Mint logos. And let's say I didn't necessarily want there to be a Linux Mint logo. And instead I want some cool pictures of landscapes. Well, if I go over to the, the navigation pane, which is on the left side of my computer or of this window, you can see that we have a couple of different names here, which are uh, version names for Linux Mint. So I can click on the Oyana menu and I now have some other options. There's this ladybug option. There is a lavender option, a small town. And if I use my mouse, there's this uh, scroll bar here on the right side, which I can drag down. I've got a few other options as well. I've got a desert or a rose or confetti. And these are all within the Oyana background options. So if I go to Alyssa, now I have even more options. I have steel, Brooklyn, the Golden Gate. And if I scroll down again, I've got even more. And so these are all really cool backgrounds that I might want to use to make the computer feel more like my own. But let's say that this isn't far enough or I really want to use my own picture uh, either that I took and I have uh, gotten onto my computer from a flash drive or that I've downloaded from social media or maybe I just found one on the internet. Well, in order to add that background, what I would need to do is I would need to go to the pictures folder. But you'll notice that it's uh, empty. And that's because I just started up my computer, so I don't have any pictures saved. But as you save pictures on your computer, uh, this will be the place where you will be able to find them. So let's go find one. I'm gonna close this folder or this window here by using the uh, orange close button. And I'm going to open up Mozilla Firefox. And from here, I am now in the Mozilla Firefox web browser. If you've used a computer before, most of this should look pretty familiar. Uh, there's nothing major about Firefox that is different from any other web browser in terms of its general use. Uh, but if this is your first time using a web browser, I suggest checking out our video on how to use Mozilla Firefox because that will give you a little bit more in-depth knowledge about uh, what goes into a, uh, a web browser and how you can interact with it. So for starters, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to my address bar, which is this bar in the topmost section of our computer. And I'm going to click somewhere in this address bar that does not contain any letters or numbers. And when I do that, we'll see that the entire text line or the web address will become highlighted in my control color, which is orange in this case. From here, I can go to my preferred search engine, whether that is Google, uh, Start Page, DuckDuckGo, uh, Bing, whatever your preferred search engine is of choice, you can start to go to that website by typing in the web address. The most common one is Google. So if I type in uh, google.com and press the enter key, I will go to Google. 
Or if I want to use DuckDuckGo, I can type in DuckDuckGo.com. And now I'm at the DuckDuckGo website. Now, depending on which search engine you are in, you will need to go to the search bar and uh, click on the search bar with your left mouse button and type in uh, what it is that you want to find a picture of. Now, let's say uh, because I'm in Portland, I want to find a picture of Mount Hood. So I'm going to type in uh, Mount Hood and I'm going to type in that I'm searching for a wallpaper. And then I can press the enter key to search. Now I'm looking for pictures. So on DuckDuckGo, I can use the images tab here up at the top left hand corner of our window. I can also see that it automatically is pulling some images for Mount Hood wallpaper. So I can left click on this images button. And now I have a large number of pictures to choose from. For most computers, uh, you'll want a fairly large image that you can scale down to fit your computer, your specific computer's resolution and screen. If you don't know what that means, uh, that's okay. What I would look for, especially if you're on DuckDuckGo, is look for this little uh, resolution notation that says 1920 by 1080. You can get one that's bigger than that, that has bigger numbers like this uh, 2048 by 1365 or uh, 1600 by 1200. But I would try to avoid going smaller than these numbers. Say for example, 1024 by 768. This is just because if you have a picture that is really small and you try and make it your background, then the picture won't look quite right. It'll look kind of blurry and grainy and uh, you might not be happy with the way it ends up looking. So in general, I would try to stick with a picture that is at least 1920 by 1080 as the smallest resolution for your desktop background. All right, so I've got a lot of pictures to choose from here. I'm going to choose this uh, Mount Hood HD wallpaper here. So I'm going to use my cursor to left click on it. And now I can see a uh, more zoomed in version or a bigger version of what this picture is that I'm looking at. And I'm deciding that hmm, I'm not really interested in this picture. So I'm going to click on the little close button in this uh, window section here and I'm gonna find a different one let's try this Mount Hood HD wallpaper here and let's say this is the one that I want to use so I can click on view file and then I can use my right mouse button to right click and then I can do save as image but also Linux Mint has a set as desktop background option. So I can left click on set as desktop background. If we wait just a minute, we'll, we will get the set desktop background option. So we have this picture of a monitor, of a computer monitor, which will give us a quick example of what this picture might look like on our monitor. If I select the center, or if I select the position, it's setting it to center, which I can see is not going to fill up my entire monitor. So I might want to change the position from center by left clicking, going down to fill. And I can see that now it's going to fill my entire monitor. So now I can click set as desktop background with my left mouse button. And now if I uh, close this Firefox window. I'll get a little uh, thing that says, hey, you're about to close Firefox. Are you sure you want to do that? Yes, I am sure that I want to do this. So I'm going to click close tabs. And now that picture I was looking at is now my desktop wallpaper. If at any point I want to change this, again, I can go down to my Linux Mint menu, go to the system settings on the favorites tab or the favorites column. 
and then I can go to the background section. Then I can go to the settings tab. And here I'll have very similar options to what I had in that previous window where I can change the aspect uh, to uh, mosaic or centered or zoom. I can just pick whichever one looks best to me and then I am all good to go. All right, and that wraps up our pre-recorded session. So uh, we are gonna cut back to uh, live Tom, who has been hopefully been able to help you out with any questions that popped up, but we're gonna go ahead and go into a live Q&A session where Tom can hopefully help you figure out any of these things that uh, maybe didn't make sense or uh, you need help kind of following along with or something that we didn't show you in this pre-recorded message. So please feel free to put any questions you might have in the chat. And uh, thanks for watching. All right, and so that is uh, pretty much it. So that is uh, both our uh, how to set up your computer as well as how to use your uh, Linux Mint computer. So what I would like to do now is I would like to open, uh, give you the ability to ask any other questions that you might have. I'm going to be here for a little bit. There haven't been a ton of questions that appeared in the comments. Uh, there is one that uh, Junix asked that I will kind of quickly uh, go over for anyone else who uh, didn't see the answer in the chat. Um, but feel free to ask any questions that you have about your free geek computer. And again, if you are watching after this webinar has ended, please feel free to leave us a comment of any questions that you have, and we will try and answer them as soon as we can. All right, so before we jump into the answer for Junix question, uh, I do want to just give you a little bit of additional resources. Uh, so one of the first ones that I wanna point out is Free Geek's own website. So if you go to freegeek.org, you can find a lot of information, including when we're open, as well as about our programs. So you can learn about the Gifted Geek Box program, the Plug Into Portland program, all of those things are uh, great for you to know, as well as how to donate to us if you have old technology that uh, is broken or no longer working or you don't have a use for it, you can feel free to donate to it to us and we can uh, try and give it a second life and give it to someone who can use it. One of the other big resources is our YouTube channel, which is what you're hopefully watching this on right now. Uh, and that is youtube.com forward slash free geek mothership. We are uploading videos and tutorials there uh, as regularly as we can, uh, more in depth about how to use uh, certain specific features of Linux Mint, primarily, specifically Linux Mint 20.1, which is the version of Linux Mint that we give out on all of our computers right now. Um, <clears throat> so you can find all sorts of different uh, great solutions. It can go a little bit more in depth of, of the a lot of stuff that we went over today. Um, hopefully with the ability to kind of find that specific video that's really going to help you. Uh, so feel free to check those out. Again, any of our webinars that we are going to be hosting, which there will be more than just this one, uh, as well as with other instructors, whether that's other staff members or some of our volunteer instructors. Uh, if you want to check out some of their videos, you can find all of those on youtube.com forward slash free geek mothership. And then the last one, which is kind of the big one, is our uh, learning platform, our uh, website that we share with all of our getting started students. Uh, we've been really working really hard to get that updated. And so I'm gonna give you just a quick uh, tutorial, not tutorial, but just kind of a, a quick walk around of what you can find on that website. Uh, the URL or the web address is really long. So we've created a uh, bit.ly link, which is uh, just a shortened URL, which will take you to our website. Uh, and that is bit.ly forward slash free geek class. And I'll put that in the chat so that you can copy it and be able to go to that website as well. In fact, I'm gonna do that right now. bit.ly forward slash free geek class. All right, so you can copy that and go ahead and check out that website. I'm gonna go ahead and open that right now just so you can see it again. 
So this is our uh, Free Geek Online. This is where we have a lot of information about how to uh, use your Linux Mint computer. So this is a lot of other uh, great ways to learn. Uh, you'll notice that we do have a quick little banner up at the top that says, hey, we're still working on this website. We are adding content to it. So uh, if you don't see anything, feel free to check back later. Or you can email me and some of my coworkers on the education team. You can find us at education at freegeek.org. Feel free to send us an email anytime. Uh, the first thing that you'll see is how to use this website, whether you are on a computer, whether that's a laptop or a desktop, as well as how to use this website on a phone or a tablet. And if we go over to the left side, we have a, a section called Getting Started with Your Free Geek Computer. And I can click on this link. And then here we have uh, some information about uh, a lot of the things that we went over today. So we go over the vocabulary, hardware and software, operating system, Linux Mint. We also have some videos that are uh, created by other platforms. So like this, uh, how Linux is built is created by the Linux Foundation. Uh, we also have some videos talking about free software and open source software created by members of the open source community. Uh, so you can feel free to check those out. And then again, we have some videos that we've created like the system configuration, as well as what certain icons mean, what things we recommend that you do in what order, and then information about our tech support. So if you don't know this already, if you've received a computer through one of our programs, whether that's uh, Gift to Geekbox or Welcome to Computers uh, or Plug into Portland, you do have a free tech support warranty that comes with that computer. Uh, that is a one year program. So you can find information about how to contact tech support. If you're having any issues, uh, you can feel free to contact them at any time. Uh, we also have how to connect to the internet, some information about Comcast Internet Essentials uh, and connecting to Wi-Fi, updating, uh, and the list goes on. So this is a really great website to be able to learn, uh, just kind of continue learning about some of the things that we've talked about. And then we also have uh, how to use your free geek computer. If I expand this by clicking on the little uh, arrow here, I've got a few things about uh, how to put together your desktop computer, what is open source, so another review as to uh, what open source is. Uh, and then if we go to the how to use Linux Mint section, we've got some really, really uh, focused bits of information like how to change the background on Linux Mint, or uh, how to update your computer, how to install programs using the software manager, uh, how to uh, do some of your homework. So if you are a student and you need to do homework, uh, talking about what are the features that we have built into Linux Mint that can help you uh, to complete your homework more effectively. So that is the uh, Free Geek class or Free Geek Online website. And again, that link is bit.ly forward slash Free Geek class. And I have pasted that in the chat. You're welcome to check that out at any time. I recommend saving it. Or again, you can come back to this video find the link. We will have it posted in the description as well as in the comments so that you can uh, find it as quickly as possible. So that is pretty much it. So I'm going to address Junik's question. I haven't seen any other questions come through. So if I don't see any other questions come through by the time uh, I'm done answering Junik's question, I'm going to uh, just kind of leave this screen up and I will be available for chat for the next probably 10, 15 minutes. Uh, but otherwise, I'll just leave this screen up so that you can see uh, any of these resources that you want to write down and just kind of hang out. All right, so Junix asked uh, in regards to the software manager. So if I close the screen and I go to the software manager, or excuse me, not the software manager, the update manager, uh, which I can do by going to the bottom right corner where the applets are. And I can click on the shield icon, which is for our update manager. Junix was asking about this switching to a local mirror. And we can see here that this banner says, local mirrors are usually faster than packages.linuxmint.com. So what this is talking about is uh, when you have updates for your computer, when you're downloading these updates, they are, they are stored on someone else's computer called a server, 
and you can download those updates from that server onto your computer, then they get installed and then you're all good to go. Now, a local mirror is essentially uh, another computer that has those same bits of information, those same updates, but they are on a, someone else's computer and that computer can be in a totally different location somewhere around the world. So let's say, for example, uh, you live in Portland, Oregon, like say, uh, like Free Geek, for example. Uh, so you might want to switch to a local mirror or a local computer that you can download these updates from and that will make sure that the updates uh, are coming from a closer point or a closer uh, computer so the updates will be faster. You can download them much faster. Uh, it's up to you. We don't always suggest switching to a local mirror, but if you want to do this, you can click on the yes button. You will need to type in your password. And then you can see that the uh, where exactly these uh, updates are coming from, packages.linuxmint.com. So if I click on this, we can see that I will have all of these different options for where I can download uh, all of these updates from. And the thing that it's going to do is it's going to test all of these connections and it's going to tell me which one is the fastest. Typically, that's going to be the one that's the closest to me. So if I just wait while it continues to test this, right now I can see that the University of Washington Mathematics uh, is the fastest because it's at the top of the list. And I know that 9.1 megabytes per second or megabits per second uh, is faster than 1.7. Uh, we do have these uh, 914 kilobytes per second, uh, which sounds like a bigger number, but uh, one megabyte is a thousand kilobytes. So uh, it's actually each of these ones and 1.2s are actually 1,000 kilobytes per second or 1,500 kilobytes per second. So now that I've kind of finished testing all of these, or my computer has. I know that I can switch to the University of Washington Mathematics, click apply, and now when I go to download updates, I will be able to get these uh, updates a little bit faster downloaded onto my machine. Now the second part of this question is, uh, is this as safe, is this as secure as downloading from the basic, uh, or from the standard uh, computer that these updates are normally saved on? And the answer is yes. So you can download these updates from the original source or from a local mirror and it will be just as safe and secure as if you downloaded from the original source. So all this is doing is just making the updates for your computer a little bit faster. It's not opening you up to uh, necessarily any increased vulnerabilities. So you don't have to worry about that. So. I'm going to go ahead and close this and my system is up to date um, and I'm going to check the uh, chat here. Junix, you're welcome. I hope that was helpful. Let me know if that uh, doesn't make any sense. I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to give it uh, just like another 30 seconds or so. And if I don't see any questions, then I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the stream, but I will still be available in the chat. So I'll still be around until 12 o'clock to be able to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, and then if there's one, if there's a big question that happens, then I will come back and uh, resume the live stream so that you can, excuse me, get a, a verbal explanation or a demonstration. Yeah, okay, well, I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to go ahead and click on the stream over video. Uh, again, I will be here until 12 o'clock. It is currently 11.43, so uh, please feel free to ask me any other questions that you have in the comments. Thank you so much for hanging out with us and being present for our first ever live stream. Uh, I really appreciate you being here, and if you are watching on YouTube afterwards, again, thank you so much for supporting Free Geek. Uh, we're glad you're here. Thank you for sticking through <laughs> technical glitches uh, like uh, me playing the wrong video and uh, we hope to see you around.